Now, another area where we've done, a, especially in the last couple of years, we put a lot of effort in modeling. It's not just the spread among uh, diseases among people, but the uh, spread of diseases among animals. Okay. So right now we're in the uh, Tulane. Um, so I came, been here, like I said, about three years. We have a postdoc working with Los Alamos to understand the spread of uh, render pest as a big disease. Um, foot and mouth disease. Um, maybe you know about the, what happened in the UK. It was a $7 billion loss in the uh, in UK over render pest. I mean, over foot and mouth disease. Um, now, what's not often appreciated is that the mathematics was used to understand the impact of different imposed interventions of foot and mouth. So when they were trying to fight foot and mouth disease um, in London or in, in the UK, they've been fighting for months and months without absolutely almost no impact. It kept, they drive it down to zero and then magically it seemed to catch up again somewhere else. Uh, and there was a man named Matt Keeling there, who's a, one of the top mathematical epidemiologists in the country. And he made a model of the spread of uh, foot and mouth over the UK. And he found what are the most important parameters in the model to stop the epidemic. And he, it was modeling the sensitivity analysis, and it was the response time. When a farmer calls in and says, I think I've got a sick cow, how quickly do you go out and quarantine that herd before a cow's mingling with that herd mingles with the others? before trucks pulling in to deliver hay, get on their tires, and they drive out to other farms and, and infect those other farms. Is that delay time? And that delay time was pretty quick. It was about two or three days. They had a guy in a pickup truck, get the phone call, they put on his list, and he'd get out there. They, off, they increased the size of the office, I think, from one to like three people. So they had same day, almost two to three hour response. And six weeks later, the epidemic was brought under control. In hindsight, it makes great sense, right? And that's what these models do. They give you, they have you think differently, and in uh, almost, in fact, every single case I can think of, in hindsight, I don't need the model to understand what I learned. But I needed the model to whack me on the side of the head to say, hey, think about how important this might be, okay? So, um, so we have different parameters that we can do. So one thing, spread of disease among animals, some things are the same, like the transmission, the susceptibility, infected animals, but some of the mitigations are different. Uh, color, infected, we, we, go, we kill cows that are infected, we can't do that with people. Uh, vaccination policy, we can force the cows to be vaccinated, we can't force people to be vaccinated. We can stop movement, we have quarantine, we have lots of mitigation on animals that we don't have on people, okay? So, after the foot and mouth disease epidemic, um, we started thinking about, well, what about if we did know, they, don't, they did not have vaccination uh, in their control mechanisms in Great Britain. So they, there is a, in fact, there are two excellent foot and mouth disease vaccines. One's somewhat expensive but works very fast. One is cheap, just takes a little longer to, to work, though. Uh, they didn't use either one of them. Thoughts why? Why wouldn't they? That means they could have stopped the epidemic cold. It's because the vaccines, um, the way they tell an animal is infected is they look for antibodies. And when you're vaccinated, the cows would develop antibodies to the vaccines. They couldn't tell an infected cow from a vaccinated cow. And the European, in fact, not just UK, but in the European Union, uh, we don't vaccinate, or they don't vaccinate against foot and mouth disease. Uh, that's not the case in the Americas. And particularly, there's an epidemic in Uruguay um, that we, that we looked at, and, and what's nice about this one mathematically, we want to know if this network model, like we did for the U.S. and the spread of the flu, would work for the spread of something like foot and mouth disease. And we needed to have, to get data, um, where at least we knew what fraction of the, the susceptibles, the cattle, had been vaccinated. Foot and mouth, it was, almost none were vaccinated in Uruguay. The epidemic came in, uh, we set up a, a network, we had county-wide data. So instead of having cities, we had counties, we knew how many farms were in each county. We knew what the road patterns were, so instead of airline, we, we had the cattle moving around on trucks. Um, and then we knew what the, the first cases were, it was, it was on April 23rd. Um, and then we also knew what was done. And we wanted to see if we could reproduce with our model 
what was done to fight the epidemic, and then we could ask the model, what could we have done better if this ha ever happens again? Okay? What, was, what are the number of infected cows most sensitive to? So what happened was, very quickly, within four days, they stopped all animal movement. Across in the whole country, they just, no cows moving. Max vaccination started on May, May 5th. Epidemic peaked on May 25th, 1,700 cases by July 10th, and uh, it was reported as under control. So unlike in Britain, it was very fast, very quick response, and they got it um, under control very, very quickly. So we were able to re reproduce it. We had that it was susceptible. A cows could be infected, but not infectious. And then become infectious, and then they're reported infectious when we see the symptoms. Now, the reason this is important, because when they're latent, um, they still may travel around to other farms and show their symptoms when they get there. And we can vaccinate them, and then they enter the projected class. So we reproduce the epidemic, and we can say, what was it most sensitive to? And again, just like with Matt Keeling in the UK, it was the delay time. If they had delayed for five more days in the vaccination policy, they would have had 50% more cases. So that rapid delay was critical. But if they'd been even faster, if they'd, uh, they'd done it five days earlier, they would have saved uh, almost oh, over a third of the cattle that got infected. So again, our model reproduced what Matt said. It's this response time that's key. Um, so, you know, it's... Uh, okay, render pest is a disease that we just finished a, a large major study across the whole U.S. on. Now, render pest, uh, clinical designs, uh, it's a mainly in cattle that can affect uh, uh, goats, swine, other things. Um, infection is six to 12 days, serious, 30 to 100 cents more percent mortality rate. When render pest comes in, it just will wipe out entire herds. Um, we haven't seen it in this country for quite a while. It's been, uh, it's, it was a major problem in Africa, uh, late 20th century. In fact, today, a year ago, last summer, it was officially eradicated. It's the second uh, disease that's been eradicated by humans on the planet. Smallpox is the first one. Okay. So why are we worried about it? Well, smallpox is, is um, in highly guarded laboratories with men with big guns and wire fences and everything else. You can't get smallpox virus very easily if you want to do a bioterrorist act. Rinderpest is still all over the place. So if you're a bioterrorist and you really want to have a, a, a hit on the U.S., uh, Rinderpest is a great disease to use because our cattle are completely susceptible. There's a vaccine. We don't stockpile. Why should we stockpile it? It's been eradicated. It takes a long time to make a vaccine. Um, so the question was, was we were funded by Homeland Security, um, what would happen if someone had an attack of render pest on the U.S. cattle industry? How quickly would it spread? Would we be able to control it? Or do we really need to, back, uh, to stockpile vaccine? Okay. So with the U.S., it's $100 billion a year. Um, we'd have an international embargo immediately. Uh, domestic consumption would essentially go down to zero. It would devastate the cattle industry if someone ever uh, hit us with this disease. Okay. So it's, um, we don't have too many yaks here. Uh, and Africa, India, uh, water buffalo and yaks are some of the more uh, key ones. But for us, it's really mostly cattle and pigs are the, the two main carriers. And so those are the two that we put into our models. Um, so within the model, again, we have this susceptible, infected, not infectious, so late infected, infectious, and then removed. Uh, we allowed quarantine. Um, we could have people both in the late and could be susceptible, might be quarantined by mistake. Uh, we can quarant uh, when quarantine means you find an infected person, or a cow in a herd, you quarantine the whole herd. Okay? Um, and it infects us people, the things that are late, and then the actual being in quarantine, you can still get infected. Um, you can vaccinate, be susceptible, you can vaccinate someone that's latently infected and it won't be completely um, efficient. Uh, we can have carriers that have are infected, but we don't know that they're infected. Um, 
So the model gets more, we, we have dead, we can cull them, we can kill the cattle when we think things are, are getting bad. Uh, so we have a much more complicated model. We also have a more complicated system. We put every county, just like in Uruguay, we put every county in Uruguay, we have every county in the U.S. in the model. So over 2,000 counties. Uh, we have the entire road system. We have the stockyards, um, Chicago, St. Louis, etc. We have the cattle moving about. We have a virtual map of the whole country, okay? Uh, and we can have, infections can be local. You infect not only people in your farm, but the nearby counties. But then you can also get on trains to stockyards in places. So we can have long range <coughs> transportation of infected cows. And we ran the epidemics. So what we do now, oh, the other thing I should say, everything is stochastic. Meaning, meaning that if you have an infected farm, you infect your neighbors with some probability. Every time we run the simulation, we get a different answer. Uh, just like a real epidemic. If we have an epidemic starting someplace, uh, one person gets infected or one, uh, one farm gets infected, we see how it spreads. Next time the epidemic, uh, even if that same farm is the initial infection, the epidemic could spread completely differently. You know, as the cattle are moved out of that farm, instead of going to the east, they may go west. So what we have to do is we have thousands of simulation runs. And we looked at what, so we randomly started the epidemic around the country, um, ran, and then we ran an epidemic, randomly started, ran an epidemic. And we found that sometimes there were large epidemics and sometimes there were small epidemics. And we want to understand why. Because we really want to do, whatever we're doing here, we want to do here. We only want to mitigate this, we have small epidemics. So here might be a, a scenario, let's we'll say these are the initial infected farms, those four farms. The, the pluses are farms that have no infections. Uh, in this case, these are the farm uh, the counties with no cattle. So there's no cattle in downtown San Francisco, for example. Um, and then you just you can watch it spread. It spreads out. So these are all fully fully infected here. And eventually, it spreads. In this case, is the Midwest was the key place where it spread. Um, so now we can ask. Okay, this is what would happen if we did nothing. So let's start looking at um, putting in movement restrictions. Let's start looking at culling. Let's put, let's put surveillance, because we assume that you don't know it's, uh, immediately that it happens. Uh, you can't put surveillance centers in every county in the U.S. You know, you can hope that you can have the uh, vets call it in, but you can also have some sentinel places that you can put. We, we're going to look very carefully here to catch it very quickly if it, say, is in a, in a stockyard. Okay. When we look at the density of cattle, you can't really see this. Um, and we can look at, take one particular case and start it in different places and see what happens. So if we started it in, say, some places, the blue curves, so these are now instead of looking, this is the number of infected cattle. Um, and sorry, this is the number, this is the number of dead cow, cattle, log tens. This is a million dead cows that's 10,000 dead cows, okay? Um, and each one of these dashed curves are the results of one simulation where we started it in a different place, okay? So for instance, this one is Imperial, California, we started it. Um, Hillsborough, Tampa, Florida is here. Those are small epidemics. Only a few hundred cattle got infected, okay? Uh, when we started it in Idaho or Pennsylvania, we had between 1,000 and 10,000 cattle infected. And when it got into the Midwest, uh, Kansas, um, Minnesota, et cetera, or some, actually Colorado and Texas are in there, we have the big epidemics with over 1,000 cattle. So instead of two humps, as we started looking at it more carefully, we actually saw three humps. The reason we saw two is because this, only a small fraction flow in this, this green thing. Um, so now we can look at we say, okay, we're three different cases, and it looks like if it gets in the Midwest, we're dead. That identified the place that we need to really protect the most. And we can look at control measures. So this is time, three years, 1,000 days, number of counties infected, not cattle. So this is 2,000 counties means every, nearly every county in the whole U.S. is infected. If we do nothing within 100 days, three months, we have every county in the U.S. infected, okay? 
if we start movement control, and I think we're starting movement control on like day five or 10, um, we cut the number of counties infected by, uh, looks like 20%. So movement control does great, but it's not enough to stop the epidemic. If we had vaccination stored, um, then, and this is not assuming everything can be, it has a 50 day delay or something before the vaccine can be distributed, made. Uh, we really stopped the epidemic dead in its tracks. But it looks like culling is still the best. When you find infected herds, you quarantine, you cull. And so this was a great comfort actually to the Homeland Security is that, yes, we are vulnerable to render pests, but with a very aggressive response, it's not this that, you know, that we have to worry about, that we actually can keep it down to something manageable. And also identify where it needs to be. So that now they've got essentially a virtual environment where they can try out different ideas. Um, we can look at how effective quarantine is. So this is quarantining one percent or ten percent or ninety percent of the, the whole population. Um, and whether you get a large, medium, or small epidemic. So we have tons and tons of these runs. So the and when the whole thing that comes down to it, again, we end up with single bullets. What do we learn from this? And in hindsight, do we really need to code? Well, can we understand this? Uh, severe epidemics happen if the disease ever hits the high density regions. If it ever gets to the Midwest, it's game over. So our mitigation should be the immediate restriction of travel, anything going to the Midwest. This includes, you know, not only the cattle, but also trucks because trucks can go into a farm and get it on the tires and the undercarriage and go to another farm. So you need to, to also account for that. Uh, that movement control is not effective enough. We need to do something else and we need to do it quickly. Vaccine is effective if it's stockpiled. We don't stockpile it. Uh, but culling is extremely effective. And so this would be our, our main line of defense. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, do, um, Animals who are certified organic, do they, do they receive these vaccines? I know they don't get growth hormones and antibiotics and so forth, but what's the, what's the guidelines, policies for I don't, I don't know. My guess is that they probably are allowed to vaccinate. Okay. Well, I mean, because that, I mean, obviously it's a growing. Right. Yeah, so um, um, it could. I don't know. Now, we're, that, now, actually, where it could be is, um, uh, you know, the, the, we, we worry about H5N1, avian flu, bird flu affecting humans. It's where the epidemic is now, it's actually in the chicken farms and things. And can we vaccinate? Now, we don't use uh, antibiotics in the organic food, but do they vac can you vaccinate the chickens? I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I, I, I can say that we did use certain vaccinations on not chickens, but other animals on the farm I worked on, and then we had a certified organic. Okay. okay. So vaccines and, and, and being certified organic are... It doesn't mean that you're not vaccinated. Oh, okay. that was my question. Yeah. Okay. I mean, no, it's just us, but um, I mean, I don't know if like... With the standard, standard, every state, yeah, they would have different guidelines. Okay. Seems like that might want to be uh, standardized. Yes. <laughs> well, it could be. I, I just don't, I don't know. I, I'd be surprised if we couldn't vaccinate. Uh, because it doesn't affect, I mean, it's a normal disease. It's, it, it, well, you're essentially you're priming their immune system to fight off an yeah. infection. Well, there's a big wave of, of, of people who are vaccinating their children. I understand. Right? And you saw how That's, high those fractions are. From, yeah, so like measles. Measles is 85%. It's very easy to get below 85%. And those are just average numbers. Uh, if it's below 85% in one particular school, that school is vulnerable. You know, it might be 90% elsewhere, but if that school is only 80%, the school becomes vulnerable. So the heterogeneity is not. Um, so let me go through a little, a little more on animal diseases, then we'll take a break, I think. The next animal disease that I've probably spent most of my career on is, is malaria.